program with the historical society uh we are uh we did okay last month we're hoping to do okay this month uh for those of you on zoom if you have questions concerns uh problems we do have someone monitoring the chat uh please put any questions into the chat or the q a and we will take them at the end uh, Oh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jenny Berry. I'm the president of the Historical Society. Thank you again for coming tonight. Um, just a couple of announcements on Historical Society activities. Uh, I know it's only April, but our summer open house season at the Anselby Cook Home next door starts the first weekend in June. So we're only about six weeks out. We are open every Sunday in the summer from two to four, as well as uh, the Saturday of Libertyville Days and the Saturday of the Art in the Park as well. Uh, we also do private tours by appointment. Uh, so if you can't make one of our open houses, maybe you have friends coming into town and you'd love to show off the cook home to them, contact us. We appreciate about a week's notice. We just need to be able to find somebody who's available to give you a tour that day. Uh, this is the last of our spring history matters sessions. We do three in the fall and three in the spring. Uh, a little bonus this Thursday, um, I am speaking at the Dunn Museum of Lake County on Libertyville's racetracks. They just opened a uh, presentation, uh, an exhibit called Let's Go to the Races or Off to the Races, one or the other, uh, which has Lake County's racing history, horses, bicycles, foot, race, uh, foot races, boat races, all that kind of thing. So Thursday night, their kickoff program, I'll be talking about Liberals racetracks. That is available as a hybrid program as well. If you go to the Lake County Forest Preserve District's website, you can sign up for in-person or online attendance. It is free. Six, that's a good question. I should know that. <laughs> 630 on Thursday. Um, all right, and just another reminder, uh, the library graciously hosts these, but all of the History Matters programs are put on by the Libertyville Historical Society which is a donation-based, volunteer-based organization. So we appreciate your support. Become a member, donate, uh, volunteer. We will take any of those. We appreciate that. Okay. All right, so let me introduce you to our speaker this evening. Uh, this is David Sadowski. He grew up riding the L all over the city. He is the author of Chicago Trolleys, Building Chicago's Subways, Chicago's Lost Elves and his newest on the North Shore line. David also runs the online blog, Trolley Dodger. And David, I'm gonna have you just show your face real quick on the screen and then I'll turn off the video. This is David. <laughs> All right, we're gonna stop the video uh, and let David get on with the presentation. There you go. Oh, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, great to be here. I'm. Um, excited about uh, sharing this history with uh, all of you and anyone watching on Zoom. And it is uh, local history, not only for the area around here in Libertyville, but also for the, uh, uh, the Chicagoland area. So um, I have uh, done four books now for Arcadia Publishing and they're all local history. We've got copies uh, here in, in back, also available online, wherever Arcadia books are sold, including my website, which is uh, called the uh, thetrolleydodger.com. This is the uh, picture on the cover of the book, which was taken by my late friend, Jeff Ween in 1961. And uh, you can see sailors um, boarding uh, the North Shoreline in North Chicago and the military Naval Base uh, Great Lakes was uh, uh, an important stop along the way. The North Shore Line, what was the North Shore Line? Well, it's been gone for 60 years now as of January 21st. So it made it until 1963, but what was it? It was a lot of different things. It was uh, intercity rail. It was local transportation, streetcars and buses. It was, uh, it was freight. Uh, it was a, it was just uh, many different things, and you'll see uh, that uh, in uh, in the pictures we're going to show. Here's a map uh, as of uh, 1933 when the Chicago World's Fair was taking place. So um, at its peak, uh, the North Shore Line had nearly 100 miles of track or lines, and um, 
So there were two uh, main lines. The shoreline route was the first one built. You'll see many pictures of that. The uh, Skokie Valley route was uh, kind of like a high-speed bypass. Uh, service went all the way, way up to Milwaukee at high speed. And then there was also the branch line to Libertyville and Mundelein. In the city, it ran on the L, so it's electrified, used third rail and uh, overhead wire, and was the fastest interurban in the whole country. And then uh, starting in 1941, they had streamlined trains called electroliners that were air conditioned. And uh, these trains uh, went up to, at speeds up to at least 90 miles an hour. And here's a picture of an electroliner. So very, very modern looking still in this day and age. But it started out as local transportation in Waukegan or in the late 1890s. And then it gradually expanded outward north and south for reaching uh, both Chicago downtown and Milwaukee. A couple of uh, a conductor and a, and a motorman, uh, now one of the very first cars in Waukegan. And the man on the left, actually his uh, grandson sent me these pictures. So by 1908, they reached Milwaukee, but uh, to get downtown Chicago, you had to change trains at Evanston and take a steam train downtown uh, on the Milwaukee road. But uh, when this map was made, actually they hadn't even reached Milwaukee yet. They were anticipating that they were going to do so. And uh, on the North shore, you had uh, various different suburbs that were served by the Chicago and Northwestern as seen here at the Winnetka station. And the North shoreline was a competitor of the uh, Chicago Northwestern and ran right next to it in their first line heading north. And here it is in Wilmette in very early days. Uh, this was the uh, changeover point. We had to change trains here. At first, you would uh, take a steam train downtown, but eventually that steam train line was taken over by the elevated. And, and uh, so then you, for a while, you still had to change trains until uh, 1919 when the North Shore Line started to run downtown. Here's uh, some track work being done, uh, extending the line. And as you can see, some of this was done using uh, horses. This is grading the uh, North Shore Line extension in uh, Wisconsin, an area called Horlicksville, where they made uh, Horlicks malted milk. Uh, this is actually Libertyville. Uh, about 1905, large station building there. Here's another picture of the station building. And that was uh, just south of uh, 176, uh, east, just east of Milwaukee Avenue. This was the original end of the line in Mundelein, at least what they called Mundelein then. It was called, first was called uh, Rockefeller, and then it was called Area, and then eventually it was called Mundelein after Cardinal Mundelein. This was the uh, connection to the Mundelein branch, which had to run underneath the Chicago Northwestern. It's a station in Lake Forest, very handsome and impressive. The back end of the station. Um, the Chicago and Milwaukee Electric, predecessor of the North Shore Line, actually built Ravinia Park, which uh, is a legacy that we, uh, millions of people enjoy to this day. Here's a train stay, stop there. Another one. Early trains were made of wood. It's the original station in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And then uh, this was a power plant where they had an explosion and fire. And uh, eventually, then uh, the uh, man was utilities magnet uh, Samuel Insel took over the North Shore Line, and then they sort of became, you know, more upscale and fancier. This is a, a very nice, fancy wooden uh, wooden car that they had. Here's a picture of Samuel Insel later in life. Here you've got their. Um, their uh, logo in the early days surrounded by this triangle, but uh, that was kind of exemplifies uh, the, the, the relationship between the employees, the company and the public. All three were necessary 
to uh, the success of the railroad. They had uh, in 1917, they started dining car service. Here, uh, some of their tracks originally on the shoreline route ran on the street. They uh, built a nice uh, terminal in 1920 in downtown Milwaukee and also had uh, observation cars and cars with uh, trains with names like the Eastern Limited. It met uh, trains heading to the East Coast and sort of a very upscale kind of service with the lounge chairs. Uh, here's one of the very first uh, North Shore trains that ran downtown on the L in 1919. This is even before regular service started. This was a special occasion. It's another wooden car in the L at Roosevelt Road. And uh, they had these uh, very interesting posters. Here it is in color. This is the original artwork. It's owned by a man who lives in Libertyville, um, David A. Myers, Jr. And he bought the, he bought his father worked for the railroad and he bought uh, these things. Otherwise they probably would have just been thrown out. And uh, here are some people at the Wisconsin State Fair examining some new uh, North Shore cars in the 1920s. This is the North Shore Line Station in Milwaukee and just about an opening day in 1920. This is part of the interior. They also had a, for a while, they had a restaurant there. But then uh, they decided to build an uh, extension uh, bypass route around the slow uh, portions of the line. And that became the Skokie Valley route, which opened in 1926. It branched off from the elevated at Howard Street. And uh, part of that now is the CTA yellow line. This is uh, under construction. More construction pictures. Again, the Milwaukee Terminal, which is very nice, sort of like an L, an L platform here, really. Uh, and then uh, in 1926, you had the Eucharistic Congress, which hundreds of thousands of people were transported by the North Shore Line and other railroads to reach uh, Munda Line, which was uh, the site of many of the events. In Milwaukee, the uh, North Shore Line uh, trains ran on the street for 2.8 miles until they reached the terminal. Here's the terminal in 1958 in color. Uh, and then we've got some shots here of the interior. And here's an electroliner there at the Milwaukee Terminal, heading out of, from the terminal onto the street, <clears throat> down the street, across the bridge. Now they took a little jog between 6th Street and 5th Street. <clears throat> and continued uh, heading south. On the, on the right, everything, all those buildings are now gone. It's been replaced by an expressway. And then here it went back onto a private right of way. <clears throat> Crossed over the Milwaukee Road. And this is out near Mitchell Field. Yes? Oh, okay, sure. This is out near the uh, Mitchell Airport in Milwaukee, uh, crossing the Chicago Northwestern. This is the stationary scene with a Piggly Wiggly <laughs> at rear of Wisconsin Institution. This is what a substation looked like, which uh, helped. They had several of these uh, along the line at, at strategic locations to help power the overhead wire. Then, uh, in uh, near Racine, they were able to go at very high speeds because uh, basically there was really nothing there except farmland. This is a giant station that they were forced to build in Zion because the Elders of that uh, religious community thought they were going to, uh, they were anticipating major growth, which never actually did occur. And uh, here's a competitor, uh, Milwaukee Electric Interurban Car 
which actually here is seen running on the North shoreline for a special occasion in 1949. And it's seen at the uh, Kenosha station. It's the only time that ever happened. This is, uh, and that they didn't have uh, crossing gates at all the different uh, road crossings. As you can see here, they were just a dirt road and uh, no gate. And the train would go by at maybe 90 miles an hour. So here is a map of the shoreline route, the original uh, configuration. You can see all those different stops along the way. And having to make so many different stops kind of slowed things down. And uh, they wanted to uh, compete with the steam railroads for a high-speed service going to Milwaukee. And eventually, the solution was to build another line a few miles to the west. Here it is uh, at the Isabella Station in Evanston, which was uh, the station seat where you see Bob Newhart getting off uh, at the Bob Newhart show credits. They undoubtedly chose that location because there were like no riders there at that station. Uh, then north of the Linden Terminal of the CTA now, the trains ran uh, one mile to the west along Greenleaf Avenue, as you can see here in color. And uh, by local ordinance, if it, even the express trains had to stop and pe pick people up if somebody flagged the train down. And then uh, uh, one enterprising photographer named Bill Robertson took a few pictures from a second story window of a neighbor's house. And this uh, shoreline route continued in service until 1955. This is the Linden Avenue station of the North Shore Line. The building at left is actually still there. They added a second floor to it though, so you hardly recognize it. And then you've got uh, the station in downtown Wilmette, where there is now a Panera and a parking lot. <laughs> this is in Kenilworth, this is partly Running on the street, this picture is from 1929. And this is the uh, Kenilworth uh, Fountain. This was on the last day of service on the shoreline route in uh, July 1955. And this picture was taken by a friend of mine, Ray DeGroot, who is still alive. He's 92 years old. I recently bought another slide taken by someone else who was there at the same time, because this, this was a photo, a photo stop. And this is in Winnetka. And eventually they uh, grade separated a few miles, about four miles of this route, along with the Northwestern tracks and were put into an open cut. It was a very large project called the Winnetka Grade Separation Project between 1938 and 1943. This is uh, one of the last uses for the wooden cars that were being phased out in uh, school tripper service for a new Trier High School. And here we are. So you had the Northwestern tracks right next to the North Shore tracks. This kind of created a bit of a dangerous situation. We had two sets of gates and cars going, trying to go around the gates and things like that. So the, the uh, Great Separation Project was uh, very helpful in, uh, in creating a more safe situation. And then uh, in uh, 1940, here you see the North Shoreline running on what eventually became the Chicago Northwestern tracks while their tracks were being prepared. And here it is uh, once the uh, once the Great Separation was finished. Again, this is taken. This picture was taken on practically the last day of service on the Shoreline route in 1955, and then. Um, Got uh, tracks going back to run parallel to the Chicago Northwestern. This is an area where they had uh, very few areas, a single track. This was one of them called the Glencoe Gauntlet, where apparently the bridge wasn't sturdy enough to support two trains at the same time. So they just figured, well, we'll just use one track. <laughs> Here it is, uh, the uh, Fanship train in 1955 at Ravinia Park. 
just outside the gates. It's where there's a parking lot now. And then uh, the building there, the shelter was um, in Green Bay Road in Glencoe was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. But of course it did not survive, although there have been um, calls for it to be rebuilt. And this is an attractive station in Ravinia as, as opposed to Ravinia Park, two different things. And as you can see, it's this very distinctive architecture. Here we are in Highland Park, looking one way and then looking the other way. Trains ran uh, parallel to the Chicago Northwestern, but here there was really nowhere for them to, to uh, take them off of the street. So for a short period of time, they ran on, on the street with, with car traffic. They had a headquarters of so the North Shore Line in, uh, North, in um, Highwood. Here's another picture from Highwood. Low angle always looks dramatic in photographs. And they had uh, quite an extensive uh, and skilled uh, group of, of mechanics in their shops to keep all of these things running, even when they got to be old. And some of those cars did get to be old. It's an interior of a uh, renovated car around 1940. And then um, in the 50s, they began painting some of these with, uh, to make them look like they had fluted sides, but it was a, it was a trick of the eye. They were, they were painted that way. They didn't really actually have fluted sides. They called these silver liners then. This is back at Lake Forest, showing the uh, kind of like retaining wall they had there, which was kind of like change in elevation near their station. This is at the left is the uh, current metro station. And then this is after the shoreline was abandoned. Port, uh, one track was kept in service for access to Highwood and for freight purposes. Here it is in color. This is, uh, I believe, Fort Sheridan, looking north. And uh, Abbott Labs in 1955. And then the two lines, the shoreline route and the Skokie Valley route came back together at an area there called North Chicago Junction. Here it is uh, again, uh, the shoreline route in North Chicago. More, more from North Chicago. And then uh, this is the original uh, terminal of the shoreline route in downtown Waukegan. Uh, after the Skokie Valley route opened, the shoreline route trains uh, did not go all the way to Milwaukee, but just terminated in Waukegan. And then later that was cut back to the outskirts of town. So this is the second uh, terminal for the shoreline route on the border between North Chicago and Waukegan. Here's a gentleman who was later mayor of Evanston purchasing the last ticket at uh, one of the stations in Evanston on the shoreline route in 1955. And here the tracks have been torn up with the connection to the CTA, which uh, as you can see is off in the distance uh, in 1955, as soon as the, uh, that portion of the line was abandoned. And then a year later here, they're tearing up the tracks in downtown uh, Wilmette. Again, the site of a Panera. Mm -hmm. And this is as far south in that the tracks went. They, they needed access to their shops in Highwood and uh, for freight service. And then they didn't go any further south than this. And then we'll uh, talk about the Skokie Valley route. The, new bypass route they, they opened in 1926 started at howard street went into an open cut this is uh an area now where the skokie swift the cta yellow line runs for five miles through evanston and over the north shore channel uh, and now it stops at dempster street this uh attractive Station building designed by Arthur U. Gerber 
has been moved and renovated. Now there's a Starbucks in there. But the trains continued further all the way up to Milwaukee. The uh, lecture liners are patterned after uh, this uh, set of trains, uh, diesel train uh, made, built by the St. Louis Car Company in 1936, but that's where they got the styling from. And because the film speeds were so slow back then, photographers had to kind of deal with that and how do, you, how do you capture a picture of a moving train when your shutter speed is very slow? Well, you kind of like move the camera as you're taking the picture. So they've developed this technique called panning. So that, as you can see here, the, the, the train is sort of sharp and focused, but the background is a little bit blurred because it was moving the camera at the time. Some tickets. Uh, this is one of the stations. They had nine stations like this on the, the Skokie Valley route, which are described as being uh, called Insul Spanish in style, only one of which still exists. And you'll see a picture of that one later, the Briargate station. It's the only one still around. And even that one is endangered. This is Edison Court in Waukegan. This is an important, uh, important station. And then uh, here... Uh, you see a conductor changing from uh, overhead wire to third rail or back or vice versa on the fly while the train is moving, kind of and kind of leaning against those those uh, that chain as the train went probably at 40 miles an hour. Kind of took a bit of daring and that that uh, gentleman, uh, Bruce Carlson, is still alive, and I believe he's the last living uh, North Shore motorman. He's at least 85 years old now. Some crossing gates in the, I believe in the Skokie area. Yes, Skokie. Heading north. Inside uh, of an Electroliner cab has an admonition against spitting in the cab. That sign is still there because the uh, the, uh, this is the same train, which is now out at the Illinois Railway Museum is undergoing restoration. Here's the dining car. Bob Hope lunched on the Electra liner and they took his picture and used it for advertising. It's another picture of people dining on the Electra liner. They served what was called an electro burger, which is basically a high class pub, bur pub burger. But in this picture, I think the upside down can of uh, Pabst Blue Ribbon is a nice touch. <laughs> and then when they used a dining car, such as the one on the left, you had a diaphragm there between, so you could walk between cars. This is the interior of the car 415, which was kept as sort of a secondary diner when the Electroliner, when an Electroliner was in the shop for service, they would use this car or for special occasions. North Chicago Junction, a bunch of sailors getting off the train. Early 1950s, a woman in a long dress in color. Many sailors uh, using the North Shore special uh, tra extra trains uh, at uh, Great Lakes Naval Air Station. And then there's a map showing uh, the tracks of where the North Shore branch line went from between uh, Lake Bluff and Mundelein. And then the second picture, uh, we've got uh, Libertyville. So basically the tracks were just south of 176. And then uh, there was a freight interchange all the way at the end of the line with the Sioux line. And freight was an important reason for having this line. So here it started out in Lake Bluff where it went underneath the Chicago and Northwestern. 
That car, by the way, is uh, out at the Illinois Railway Museum, car 160. Uh, here it is in color, excuse me. So at first it was a shuttle operation, but then when the uh, Skokie Valley route started, they ran through trains that went out to Libertyville and Mundelein. I believe this is crossing the Chicago Northwestern, just south of 176. It's a line car out on the out on the line, picture taken from the rear of the of another train. Uh, then this, I believe, is Roundout, where it was on an embankment to go over the Milwaukee Road, crossing the Desplaines River, I think. And here is the Libertyville Station in color, very close to the end of service, late winter of 62. Here's it, here it is from the other end. And it's sort of like it was a residence for, for the attendant. And I'm not sure what happened to it after the line was abandoned because uh, it's long gone. And then there was some uh, freight trackage in Libertyville which led to a lumber yard. And uh, this is a picture taken on a fan trip in the early 1950s out on that trackage, which extended for a few blocks. And there was a station near Mundelein called Perpetual Adoration, which was, uh, well, there's a, a Eucharistic adoration. They have like uh, some sort of uh, church services going on there 24 hours a day, which is why they call it Perpetual. But of course, this was a favorite stop and because of the name for fans of the North Shoreline. They had shelters like this and many of their smaller stops. Here we are at the terminal in Mundelein at night. Again, a very distinctive architecture. There were three stations like this, designed by Arthur U. Gerber. Uh, the Kenosha was one, uh, Dempster Street in Skokie is another would be, and this was the third. This one has been torn down. The one in Kenosha was modified and then the uh, one in Skokie was been preserved. Here it is in color. And here's what's there today. But uh, a couple of blocks away now, there is a metro station with the new North Center line. And this, this is looking towards the, uh, this is where it ended, where it had this uh, interchange with freight interchange. This is a new Mundelein station on the North Center Line, opened in 1996, only a couple of blocks away from where the North Shoreline Mundelein station was. Now, downtown, back at this time, the all the trains ran in one direction around the loop. That was the case from <laughs> 1913 until 1969. The North Shore Line's major station was in Roosevelt Road, although for a uh, time in the 20s and 30s, they did have trains that went down to the south side and went onto the Jackson Park branch of the L. This is south of the loop around 8th Street. Lecture liner in the early 1940s was brand new. World War II logo. And here's a station that the North Shore Line had at Adams and Wabash. So you had a, uh, you could enter the, a building at Adams and Wabash at street level, go upstairs to you know this North Shore Line station, and then it was a direct walkway connecting with the Adams and Wabash station on the elevated. Here a train, a North Shore train is turning the corner at uh, Wabash and Lake. That's the site of uh, where a, tr a train fell off, the tragically fell off the tracks in 1977, and I believe 13 people killed. This is the old Clark and Lake Station. This has since been replaced. And this is uh, the area they call this Tower 18. This is at uh, Lake and Wells. It was one time the busiest railroad interchange in the world before the subways were built. 
crossing the Chicago River. Chicago Avenue Station. This is Belmont, I believe, yes, and in color. Uh, here, uh, train is stopped at a special extra platform that the CTA built in the early 1950s so that you couldn't transfer directly between the North Shore Line and the CTA without paying fare. And here it is, here it is, same uh, extra platform looking in the other direction with an electroliner. Uh, Wilson at near Wilson Avenue. And then uh, crossing Broadway. Near uh, Loyola University. Again, Loyola. And then uh, here this train is uh, heading south from Howard using overhead wire. Because at this point, third rail hadn't been installed yet on that one track, which was used for freight. And here, uh, I believe this is uh, southbound at Howard. Someone's getting off carrying a valise. Again, heading south from Howard. on the uh, Evanston branch of the L. Those would have been shoreline trains. And then on a fan trip, you here you've got uh, an electroliner on the south side, stopping at a place that it, it never stopped because by 1941, when these trains were built, they had stopped running to the south side, but this is on a fan trip. This is at Indiana and 40th Avenue. And, um, then we've got a, the uh, br uh, bridge over the Illinois Central. And then the tower at left was for the Tower Theater, which was one of those giant movie palaces that you had in Chicago. It's the end of the line at 63rd and Jackson Park, 63rd and Stony Island, actually. And then they had city service, uh, streetcar service in Waukegan and in Milwaukee. This is in Milwaukee. The car up in the embankment is a North Shoreline dinky, they called it. Uh, it was a, a Bernie car. And then uh, you've got a, a Milwaukee electric streetcar, their competitor, down on the ground. And people would, would go up that, uh, they would climb all those stairs just to save a penny or two on the fare. So you had some conventional streetcars here. They ran in Waukegan and Milwaukee. This is another Bernie car. Running on the streets in downtown Milwaukee. In Waukegan, an area called Merchant's Curve. And then on a fan trip, you had uh, some, in 1946, some old wooden North Shoreline cars, one last time, are, are here uh, shown running on the streetcar trackage in Waukegan. This is downtown Waukegan. I think this is a, uh, across the, from the courthouse. The uh, end of the line of Milwaukee, which was also um, a few blocks away from where the terminal was built, but this was at first was the original location where the uh, North Shoreline interurban trains ended right in the middle of the street in Milwaukee. Got freight, uh, including baggage service. If, if you wanted to run a package to Milwaukee or points in between up until the time the line quit, your best bet may have been to use the North Shoreline for that service. And uh, in the loop, just south of the loop, they were using the old Congress Street Terminal of the Elevated for baggage loading and unloading. And then they had uh, uh, piggyback service. They were, they were the pioneer of what is now known as piggyback. But eventually there was too much competition from truckage. So they stopped 
uh, running the, the, that kind of freight service in 1947. But they continued to run regular freight trains with these electric locomotives right up to the end. Some various uh, freight trains. They call this a merchandise dispatch car. And then they even delivered some of the L cars to the CTA, to Skokie shops in the 1950s. Here, uh, here's a freight train running on what had been the, on one track of what had been the shoreline route before it was, uh, everything was abandoned. Another freight train. And then here's a merchandise dispatch station on uh, Montrose in the city of Chicago and an electric locomotive at that station. There was a ramp, as you can see, that ran up to the L. And then during World War II, they were patriotic and you could, uh, they encouraged you to buy war, war bonds. And then uh, here we've got uh, more pictures of freight. In the icy cold of winter. I think this is Lake Bluff. The merchandise dispatch cars sometimes showed up on the L in uh, downtown Chicago. This uh, freight is uh, taken on the last full day of operation, January 20, 1963, in North Chicago. And then after the shoreline route was abandoned, and this is uh, the trackage they had, as you can see, there's sort of like this dotted line is this truncated route of uh, the, what had been part of the shoreline route. Again, North Chicago. Uh, Waukegan Edison Court, uh, where many cars were added and added and, and cut because the uh, service was, uh, the ridership was a lot less north of Waukegan. And it's a fan trip of some sort. And that little boy that you see in the picture undoubtedly would be, if still alive, would be collecting social security now. <laughs> but probably remembers this moment, if even if he does. It's a fan trip at Kenosha. Near uh, Green Bay Road. And this is uh, William A. Steventon recording the audio sounds of North Shoreline trains at Mundelein. And um, those uh, recordings still exist and uh, you can listen to them. Now I've put uh, many of them out on compact disc. You can, you can listen to the actual sounds of the North Shoreline and many other railroads. This is the unfortunate um, wreck of, of one car that was uh, where it, it hit a, it hit an automobile that had gone around the gates and the driver of that automobile was killed. And while people were on, on the train were seriously injured, no one else lost their life. I believe that accident happened in 1959. The interior of a uh, renovated coach. And this is an un, uh, unrestored car, one of the oldest ones they had, which were built in 1915. They're 48 years, nearly 48 years old by the time the line quit, including this uh, coal fired stove. And Mr. Uh, Myers uh, salvaged one from car 150 after abandonment, and he had to have the scrapper get it out through the roof. But he still has that now, and he lives in Libertyville. So in 1961, with uh, with the uh, interurban wanting to abandon service because they were losing money, uh, mayors of several suburban uh, towns and villages met with Mayor Daly to see what could be done, and he suggested them the creation of a mass transportation district. And eventually, such efforts led to the... Uh, Regional Transportation Authority, but not until more than 10 years after the North Shoreline quit. And then here you can see on the, le on the left, you got the co competition 
the Chicago and Northwestern uh, by levels hauled by diesel trains, and which is a configuration which uh, Metro still operates now. And the only uh, air conditioned car cars at the North Shoreline had were the two electroliners. So they really needed new equipment here again. These are uh, some by levels, Northwestern by levels at their lakefront uh, terminal in, in Milwaukee, which is not there anymore. And here we've got uh, kind of an action shot, uh, train heading at high speed and the photographer pushed the button at exactly the right moment to take this picture. This is what they call the decisive moment. And then right before the abandonment in 1963, uh, they, they renovated this car and put all new seats in it. Even, this is in November, 1962, just two months before the abandonment. They were still that, the employees were still that dedicated to offering uh, service. Uh, these are a couple of fan trip trains on the Mundelein branch. Then you've got, uh, they had a, a bus company that they owned after the streetcars were abandoned. They had bus service in uh, Waukegan, and this is a, a North Shoreline bus uh, taken uh, in a picture along with a North Shoreline train. There were people who tried to keep the line running. Uh, it was a commuter association wanted to buy the, the property, and they fought a legal battle to keep it from being abandoned, which they lost but their efforts paved the way for other things to be saved later. The, the uh, tax benefits of abandonment were just so great that there was no uh, way anybody would come up with uh, the money. This is a picture of motorman Howard Odinius, who was one of the 10 founders of the Illinois Railway Museum. This is uh, one of the very final fan trips stopping at a station where the North Shoreline never stopped, one of the kind of like in-between stations on what is now the the uh, CTA yellow line, the Skokie Swift. Uh, last full day of operation at speed in North Chicago. An overview of the Milwaukee terminal area. And this is uh, on the last full day of operation, January 20, 1963. As you can see in the car on the left, the silver liner, the special red nameplate has already been swiped. Somebody's already taken it. And then here I recently uh, bought this slide, which is taken at the same time of the same two cars on the same day. And then the very last night, we had some enterprising photojournalist types like John Gruber and Charles Fretzen, who came out to the terminal to take pictures of the interior, lunch and the lunch counter. Charles Fretzen took this picture. So in this picture, a sailor is giving his girlfriend an engagement ring. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. She's like examining it probably to see if it's real. Uh, this is one of the one of the last uh, Electra liners to leave uh, the downtown Milwaukee. Here it is at Roosevelt Road on the very last day. This here could possibly be the final Electra liner train to make it all the way far, uh, far as uh, Roosevelt Road before heading back to uh, an uncertain future after abandonment. And this may have been uh, taken also on the final night in Milwaukee. Back then it was not, not easy to take a picture like this, let me tell you. You definitely needed a tripod or something like that. Also the last, the very last night, This is the final southbound train at, that as it had reached Howard Street uh, station on the L. And here's the back end of it as it is leaving on its way towards Roosevelt Road. And here it is at, at Roosevelt Road. The motorman and conductor hug each other as a press photographer takes a picture. 
and then the light, the headlight is taken off the train to be put back onto the other side to run empty all the way back uh, north to headquarters at Homewood. And this was uh, the end of the line for that storied interurban. And the temperatures reaching nearly 20 below zero. This is David A. Myers, Libertyville resident, uh, recording some audio on the last northbound North Shoreline train. And I'm not sure if this is him, but it could be because he had a job like this uh, cleaning cars uh, at the Milwaukee terminal. And he also worked in the shops. He had a, his father worked for a long time for the railroad also. This is what they call it. This is the day after abandonment. It's later in the day on January 21st. They call this a cleanup train. It's running on the wrong track, southbound, going up and just picking up various cars along the line to uh, bring them back to uh, the headquarters. And then this is the, the also day after abandonment. This is the lunch lunch counter, which had this uh, picture of an electroliner kind of stenciled onto it in gold. And a few months later, three months later, that uh, mirror was still there and it probably was destroyed along with everything else in this terminal when it was torn down. Then after abandonment, all the cars were stored in different parts of the line where there were no grade crossings uh, that anyone had to worry about. And then uh, many of them were, while some were saved for museums and such, others were simply torched. As you can see here, and this is, a, this is what I mean about the fluted sides. It didn't really have fluted sides. It was just painted on. But it sure looked like it did. They're, they're cutting everything apart for the scrap metal value. This is the last piece of North Shoreline equipment to be scrapped on site. It was a wooden snow plow. And Mr. Myers told me that he found someone to take it. But by the time they had, well, they procrastinated and taking it away, by the time they wanted to take it away, all the tracks had been removed around it. <laughs> so there was no way to move it and it had to be scrapped. And here is a train um, going to a museum. This is uh, 727, which is in Iowa. It's been in Iowa ever since. Oops. This is uh, rails being torn up on the Skokie Valley route. The Electroliners fortunately were saved. They were sold to the Philadelphia Suburban Transportation Company, also known as Red Arrow in uh, Philadelphia suburbs. And then they were repainted in a new paint scheme and christened as Liberty Liners, where they ran until 1976. And after being sitting around for a few years, they eventually went to the well, one went to the Illinois Railway Museum, the others in a museum in Pennsylvania. And then five miles of the uh, Skokie Valley route were purchased by the CTA. And one about one year after abandonment then became the Skokie Swift, which is uh, today's CTA yellow line. And this is the area looking north uh, from Dempster, the part which uh, where the uh, L does not run anymore. And then the Northwestern here is shown operating some freight on what had been the North Shoreline. And this is the, um, well, this is a Libertyville Mundelein branch after abandonment. And then the demolishing of the historic North Shoreline sta uh, station and terminal in Milwaukee in 1964. In 1966, some of Mr. Myers's memorabilia, things he'd saved, were uh, shown in an exhibit in Racine commemorating the North Shore Line, including the dispatcher's desk. But then now, uh, starting in, I believe, 2018, you had uh, electric trains uh, back on the streets of Milwaukee with uh, the new modern streetcar line called the Hop. The first time in <clears throat> first time in fifty five years. And this is the uh, very similar insult Spanish Beverly Shore station on the South Shore line, which of course has been saved 
and is being renovated. Here you can see they're adding a second track to what had been a single track portion of the line. And while this uh, station is on the National Register of Historic Places, the uh, Briargate station, the, the final one uh, that survived in the North Shore Line, has a, doubt, a doubtful future and may eventually be demolished. This is the uh, Milwaukee terminal again. So it's 38 fast trains daily, well, 19 round trips, five of which were, you know, five each way, total of 10 were electroliners. And then now you've got about six or seven Amtrak trains going between Chicago and Milwaukee each day. And, and the fare, if you work out the fare to Milwaukee, it's actually about the same, maybe even slightly cheaper today to take the train to Milwaukee than it was back in the day. And the Ravinia Festival is a legacy of the North Shore Line. Uh, this sign from the Milwaukee Terminal is now at the Illinois Railway Museum in Union, where they have a portion of the ticket booth incorporated here. And here's the Briargate Station as it looks today with an addition built onto the, uh, the side. And then uh, it's for rent. And then you've still got some uh, crossings here. This is uh, uh, Wesley Road, where you can still see this uh, sign that says North Shore Line. And then here's a CTA train on the yellow line, which used to be part of the Skokie Valley route. That's car 727, the one we saw in the flat car in operation in Iowa just a few years ago. And it is still able to keep up with highway traffic. And this is a section of original North Shoreline track, which I was able to track down south of Lake Cook Road. And I had to walk through the mud to uh, get to this point here because uh, it had just rained, I think, the night before. But there is still, amazingly, uh, still a little bit of trackage that is still there. And this is a picture by artist Mitch Markovitz commemorating those uh, observation cars and named trains that they had back in the 20s. And then here you see a silver liner, car 761 at East Troy in Wisconsin, where they, it went under a, a complete uh, restoration. It's beautiful work. And this is the uh, interior of the Electro Liner at uh, IRM. And it's got some volunteers working on it. Part of it's done, part of it isn't. It's a few years away. It's going to be, uh, when finished, a million dollar restoration. This is how the Electro Liner looks today uh, at IRM, where uh, eventually you may be able to ride it. And uh, that's the end of our program. And I wish to thank you very much. And I'll take any questions that you might have. We'll take questions in the room and then I'll ask one of the online ones. Okay. Do you want to repeat? The... Go ahead. We have one here in the room first. Okay, go ahead. Uh, did not generate all their own power or what power some places? And... Well, at first they had to uh, produce their own power, but eventually you had power that you could buy from, you know, eventually it all became organized as basically in. in as different utilities like Commonwealth Edison or uh, Wisconsin, I imagine it was something different, maybe Wisconsin Electric or something like that. So they bought power commercially and it was, they were good customers of say uh, Commonwealth Edison to the point where Insul eventually bought them and, uh, and they helped to uh, distribute power into the suburbs and, and rural areas, which didn't have it. One of the questions we have online is, how does the high speed of the North Shore Line compare to that of Metra today? Well, Metra is limited as are uh, just about all railroads to 79 miles an hour. And um, I mean, Metra is pretty fast, but it's diesel. So maybe it doesn't start and stop as uh, 
quickly, maybe it doesn't start as quickly, but the high speed is sort of similar. Although the North Shoreline trains went a little faster, they were capable of going even faster than they did. The, uh, they were they were running trains at 85, 90 miles an hour routinely, but they could have gone a lot faster. They had a test in the early 50s and they uh, clocked the electroliner at uh, 111 miles an hour, but it was too fast for the gates to activate properly. It would have put, a, would have put too much strain on the motor, so they didn't want to do that. All right. Uh, how difficult was it to organize a fan trip? Any idea of the cost? The North Shore Line seemed to have a lot of these. The CTA will let fans charter trains to this day. Well, back then, uh, Sunday was a day when you did not have a lot of ridership on an interurban. And routinely, the fan trips that did take place were uh, almost always going to happen on Sundays. There are fewer trains running anyway to get in the way of uh, fan trips. I, I don't know offhand uh, what the cost uh, could have been. I, I may be able to find that out because I've got a friend who was involved with some of these fan trips even back in the 50s that I could ask. But uh, with concerns about uh, insurance and liability and safety being more paramount nowadays, it's become more and more difficult to operate any of those fan trips. This one is related. What is the term for a ride on retiring a retired train? Is it a fan ride? On a retired retiring train? I'm not sure there's a special name for that. Uh, I mean, well, like, like I say, there's a, the cleanup train was, uh, it was like the last train, you know, collecting empty box cars and things like that on the route. But otherwise, I'm not aware of a special train. I have ridden on some last trains, but nobody ever gave them special names. Uh, we've been using the term fan trip. So someone's asking, what is a fan trip? A fan trip, well, by the 1930s, you had groups of railroad fans. And many of them were working for railroads and uh, who uh, organized. And so they became, you know, they were always people who were interested in trains, but then they either became organized into groups in the 30s and started to have programs that they would put on and still do that to this day. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, those are the people who put on fan trips. They're organizations. The Illini Railroad Club, the Central Electric Rail Fans Association, et cetera. Okay. Um, I think these two questions were answered. Is the Milwaukee Terminal building still standing? Oh, no, it's gone. Torn down in 1964. Uh, for a while, it was just an empty lot, like a parking lot. There's a very nondescript building there now. Uh, and this one you've mentioned several times. Are there any old North Shore Line cars found in Union, Illinois at the Railroad Museum? They have several. They have more than anyone else. Uh, they might have as many as 18 different pieces of equipment of one kind or another, which are related to the North Shore Line, whether it's a caboose, a coach, an electroliner, you name it. None of the uh, electric locomotives were saved, however, because the scrap value was too much. They had too much metal. In them, and so they, the railroad wanted too much money for that. Okay, one more online question, and we'll see if there's any others in the audience. With more interest in public transportation, any chance that interurban rail system will be revived? Well, um, it, after the Pacific Electric quit in 1961 in California, and the North Shore Line quit here in 1963, uh, author William Middleton called that the end of the interurban era. And while you have things that run between cities now, uh, as the South Shoreline does, and South Shoreline was, and it can still be considered an interurban, everything that happens now is uh, kind of falling under the heading of commuter rail or intercity rail. And then even in places like uh, parts of Los Angeles area where they have put tracks back, trains back in, uh, that were once part of an interurban line. They don't call it interurban. I mean, it's just, it's just like the the uh, LA Metro line between LA and Long Beach. That's exactly where the Pacific Electric ran, but nobody's calling it an interurban now. It's sort of a, a sociological term. It's a historical term of a, of a time that's that's passed. Yes. Where did uh, the North Shore service? 
The question is, where did the North Shoreline service and maintain their equipment? They had a number of different shops. Main shops were in, in uh, Highwood, but they also had some shops in Milwaukee. Um, so, and I think once in a while they would they would actually have a few things done on the L, but it's mainly in, in Highwood. Yes. I saw a poster that was talking about hunting along the North Shore line. Uh, it was like an advertising. Like a, oh. if you have any information on that. Question is about posters uh, for the North Shore line advertising hunting. There were a number of different advertising posters that were commissioned by the railroad, by the insole interests uh, in the 20s mainly. And for the North Shore line the, and the South Shore line, and they're beautiful posters and many have been reproduced to this day. And uh, some of the depictions were kind of fanciful. So I'm not sure exactly where they were planning on hunting or what they were shooting at in that <laughs> description. It was just, maybe it was just somebody's uh, figment of their imagination. Okay. Yes. Where did your interest in North Carolina? Oh, where did my interest uh, in the North Carolina begin? Well, I. I never wrote it in in real in uh, when it was still around. However, I, I read about it in news. Newspapers when uh, the abandonment one, I'm sure she would have said it doesn't go where we're going. <laughs> and then if I had uh, tried to talk my dad into purchasing an Electro Burger, on the train, which back then was cost a dollar forty, which is the equivalent of over ten dollars today, he would have said, "I can get you a dozen White Castle hamburgers <laughs> for one of those at twelve cents a piece." So then, um, actually, my dad took me riding on the uh, first day of the Skokie Swift operation when they were offering free rides, and that was a thrilling ride because those trains. Single car uh, trains were going 65 miles an hour. They have since slowed them down some uh, a bit for safety's sake, but back then they were just trying to fly as fast as they possibly could, and that was a thrilling ride. So uh, then, the, when these when they started to have uh, railway museums that offered rides, we started to go out. And when the when the Aurora and Elgin quit and was going to be totally abandoned. We, uh, my family took a Sunday ride out to Wheaton and looked at all the old cars, the Royal Elgin cars were there in the shop in the uh, Wheaton yard. So my dad was kind of interested in that. He took me, he did take me on a ride in a Chicago streetcar before they were abandoned in 1958. So that he wanted me to have the experience. So my dad was kind of inclined that way. He wasn't what you'd call part of an organized group or anything like that, but I, and then I was just sort of interested in it. And I just, you know, would buy all the books um, that were published. And then I just never thought I'd get to the point where I'd publish one myself. But uh, I just maintained the interest and kept collecting more and more pictures until finally I had the pictures that you saw here. Yes. Um, the North Shore line was always always ran on direct current, right? With all the substations? Oh, uh, yeah, it's 600 volts DC, just like the L, yeah. whether it was overhead wire or um, third rail. Right, yeah, because I remember the uh, substation, or like full substation, the one in Libertyville, specifically by Forest Street and 176. Um, yeah, there's still, the there's still a former North Carolina substation that still exists on the on the branch line between Libertyville and Mundelein, yes. Yeah, so I just, it's houses shape. Yeah. So no, because I know that in so, uh, Edison was really in the direct current, Westing House was in the AC alternate current. Well, Insol had been the right hand man of uh, Thomas Edison. Yeah. And, uh, but, so, uh, but he had many innovations of his own, the idea of distributed power, um, the way that basically electric uh, utilities are run now, that all comes from Samuel Insel. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, the Roosevelt stuff that you mentioned, is that where the outline was? Or 
Roosevelt? Oh, it, it's exactly the same. Uh, the question is where uh, where was the Roosevelt Road station? Well, it basically is in the same location as the current L station. However, um, between 1949 and 1963, the North Shore Line had exclusive use of that station because that was no longer used as a stop by the CTA when they they took over in the late 40s and they changed around north-south service. They they didn't use that uh, station anymore and their trains went through the subway then uh, on the south side. But uh, they, they shared that station with the rapid transit company before that and then uh, had exclusive use of it until 63. And then uh, within a few years, uh, that station was torn down. There was no station there for some years. And then eventually one was put back, which is there now. Uh, we have a couple of online uh, questions or comments. There's someone who is uh, a volunteer at the East Troy Electric Railroad uh, Museum, I guess. So he's yes. saying come visit there, uh, as well as there's a Fox River Trolley Museum in South Elgin. Those are uh, both excellent museums that are well worth a visit. Um, and then we have, I think this is related to the person was asking about reviving uh, interurban. How about converting the EJ and E rail line from Waukegan to Joliet into an interurban line? Well, um, it's not likely that you're going to see very many uh, new lines. I mean, it was uh, remarkable even when you had this new metro line, which uh, is called the North Center Service, North Central Service that uh, runs uh, now to Mundelein and, and parts further north. That was in 1996, and that was the first new line in many decades, and it's been the last uh, such improvement. And in Wisconsin, the uh, political climate hasn't been friendly to transit uh, in recent years. There was uh, proposals to have commuter rail service between Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha, and so far, nothing has happened with that and using existing trackage. So I don't think it's too likely that you're going to see um, a lot of money spent on uh, an idea uh, such as that. Uh, we have two more questions online, then we'll see if there's any remaining in the audience, and then we will uh, wrap up. Did the North Shore Line ever use the Illinois Central tracks? No. Um, no, they, they only ran on the, on the uh, rapid transit system. In the city, no, they had it's the South Shore Line that shares trackage with the Illinois Central, which is now the Metro Electric. But uh, no, there, it's, uh, there was never any connection. Can you tell us more about the coal fired stoves in the cars? <laughs> well, those, that car that, that car that that was in was built in 1915, mm -hmm. and uh, coal was uh, a major way of heating. Uh, in many places until at least the 1950s when it started to be phased out. Uh, so you did, eventually you had different ways of heating a, a rail car. And uh, nowadays it's all done uh, electric, there's electric heating on, uh, and air conditioning on, uh, on the CTAL cars and such. So uh, that's just what they had in 1915. And uh, it continued in use until the end of service in 1963 on some of those older cars. It was just the oldest of the cars that had that on the North Shore Line, not all of them. I just wanted to piggyback on that uh, with that question about running uh, uh, interurban on the old BJ E line. CN runs 20 more trains a day on that line, so I think you have a lot of opposition, <laughs> let alone issues with uh, scheduling. Yeah, yeah, in many cases now, uh, the question is about this EJD proposal that was mentioned. Yeah, you, you have to share the, the tracks with freight trains, and you've got that many freight trains happening in a day. Naturally, the railroad that owns that line is going to want them to have first priority and not the other way around. Do you have any other questions in the audience? I right, well, want to remind you that the Cook House opens the first weekend in June. If you're interested in learning more about Historical Society membership or how you can help, Chuck, raise your hand. Chuck. Say hi. Okay. If you're not a member, you should become a member. It's only uh, $10 and usually $25 for family. And if 
benefits of looking at uh, the archives and, and seeing the cookhouse, some of the history behind it, and find out some of the things that Jenny does. She's a real, very good organizer. So it's a good group of guys in it. I would recommend you come in. I'm a third generation person from Libertyville. My parents were there in 1904. And, uh, Born at Condell and get Lakeside Cemetery at that point. Chuck will be at the table out in the lobby if you want to ask him any questions. Um, so we have a round of applause. Oh, David. Oh, I, I should mention that we have books for sale. Oh, yeah. Now, um, I've written four books for Arcadia. I've, I've all, all four of them I brought here today, but we uh, we sold all the copies of the North Shore and books that we brought, but I have more coming. In. I, I should have in a couple of days, and so if I'm to buy one out at a special price, I would be glad to mail it to you at my cost, no extra charge. And there's a special price that we have on all these books, and uh, they're available right over there uh, for your perusal. <laughs> uh, thank you for our speaker tonight. <laughs>